My guest today is Jay Tower. Jay, how are you? I'm great. How are you, David? I'm doing really well. What What do you do for a living, Jay? I am one of the owners at Trailhead Technology Partners, and we are a custom software application development consulting company. So we help our clients build custom software when something off the shelf won't do it. Awesome. And you also do a lot of speaking at conference, and I, I, I know this. We've done it for years, and I heard you gave a talk on recently on migrating legacy applications. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, I've been doing a talk recently at, at conferences that's called something like how to migrate uh, your legacy ASP.NET project to ASP.NET Core uh, oh. gradually or something like that. Uh, okay, and that can be a big deal if it's a big project with lots of modules. Right, exactly. Uh, that, what, what are some of the challenges? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously one of the challenges is just the fact that there's a lot of code out there already. That's uh, ASP.NET projects. When I say ASP.NET, I just mean ASP.NET running on .NET framework, you know, so four point something or before. And there's a lot of code that exists out there. And as you kind of alluded to, if you've got a bigger project that's written that way, uh, there's a lot of changes in ASP.NET to ASP.NET Core, and it can take some time to you know have your team upgrade all of that and it's not very agile to just lock everybody in a room and say don't come out until this is all done right that's yeah, very two years later <laughs> exactly and uh two years later and like a million bugs probably right potentially so, yeah to do it um, kind of incrementally over time is a you know obviously a more agile approach and it's also a much more successful approach so um, this talk is kind of about how to go about doing that and there's some great tooling available for Microsoft now for that. Yeah. That's a challenge uh, incrementally because sometimes these things depend on one another. And if you migrate one thing, you might break a dependency. That's right. Yep. What's How do you address that? You know, one of the things that's really useful there that doesn't get a lot of buzz anymore is something called .NET Standard. Um, so, you know, a lot of times that shared code you're referencing will be in class library projects uh, if you're talking about .NET. And... Um, Class libraries can be compiled against a particular version of .NET Framework. They could be compiled against Mono, I suppose. They could be compiled against a version of .NET or .NET Core nowadays. Uh, but you can also target something that's called .NET Standard, uh, which Microsoft doesn't talk about as much anymore because with the last couple versions of .NET, they kind of have this concept of you know one .NET, like all the .NETs have come together. Uh, but it's when you're thinking about legacy code, that doesn't necessarily apply. You still got multiple legacy versions of .NET. So if you've got a class library that you originally built on .NET Framework and you want to bring that forward and use it in both your .NET Framework code while you're incrementally migrating and your you know, ASP.NET Core uh, modern code, you can do that really easily by just taking your class libraries and retargeting them all to compile against this .NET standard. And then basically that same class library without having to have multiple copies of it, that same class library can be run under .NET Framework or .NET Core versions. Hmm. Uh, what about, uh, not everything has a binary dependency. Sometimes you're just calling an API and you have an endpoint. Um, yep. And there's a potential of breaking that as well if you're migrating something. Sure. Yeah, it's uh, especially good to be aware of. In ASP.NET Core, there's a lot of JSON serialization changes that have happened. Uh, so, you know, in, in legacy versions of ASP.NET, we would largely use something called JSON.NET or Newtonsoft.JSON is the actual name of the library um, that most people know as JSON.NET. And uh, that would be what you'd use to serialize and deserialize your JSON, uh, you know, payloads by default. That uh, has changed. So that default is actually something that's built into the system namespace now. Uh, in ASP.NET Core by default. But keep in mind that that same .NET standard that I was talking about, the Newtonsoft folks have taken advantage of that. And if you have some legacy code that's serializing, deserializing JSON from you know some endpoint and you want to basically upgrade that code to ASP.NET running on a modern version of .NET, uh, you can do that and you can still use JSON 
uh, newtonsoft.json to, to do that because it's been compiled against .NET standards, so it works in any flavor of .NET now. All right. uh, and we were talking before we started recording about uh, something called a reverse proxy. Where, yeah. where does that fit into this migration strategy? Yeah, that's a great question. So obviously when we're talking about migrating specifically web applications that are uh, .NET, uh, so ASP.NET to ASP.NET Core, we're talking about uh, the need to kind of do that incrementally. There's, you know, if you're talking about WinForms or WPF or a bunch of other examples, it's a pretty simple migration path to go from .NET framework to a modern version of .NET. But if you're doing a web project, uh, ASP.NET and ASP.NET Core are very different, different configuration, uh, different dependency injection, different um, startup, different uh, pipelines, you know, the way the pipelines work. One of them is very heavily, you know, the old one is very heavily tied into IIS, Internet Information Server, and the .NET Core version is not. So there's just tons of differences, which means that that ASP.NET project has to be done a lot more manually. There's just a lot more, you know, manual heavy lifting to do. And because of that, it can be helpful to do it gradually over time. And there's this pattern for a gradual upgrade that you may have heard of called the Strangler Fig pattern. So that's a familiar name. I don't think like I have. So <laughs> okay. Describe that for me. So my understanding is that it comes from an actual, an actual vine plant that I believe is in Australia. And it actually starts from a seed that gets dropped it's just, from a is bird. Is this the kudzu plant? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's the same thing or not. Uh, <laughs> you can tell me at the end of the description and see if it sounds the same. Um. So a bird will kind of drop it, and it'll you, if it falls, it'll kind of land in like the the you know top of a tree somewhere, uh, maybe like nestled between the tree's branch and trunk or something like that. It'll start kind of growing a vine from up there. That vine will go down the tree, kind of wrap all around it. Once it gets to the ground, it'll sink into the ground, and kind of wrap around the tree's roots underground. And of course, all of this takes a long time, but as this fig plant this fig uh, vine is growing on the tree the tree of course is none the wiser that it's about to get choked out but what happens is eventually that completely eats all the resources up out of the ground the tree can't get any anymore now the tree is essentially this dead backbone with a you know big vine plant that's taking advantage of it so that it can reach up mm. to the sunlight and, and the canopy and so that's this kind of you know, visual the displaces the, the new displaces yeah. the old Exactly. Yes, it's kind of a violent example, a slow motion violent example, but it's a, <laughs> it's a nice visual picture of, of that kind of gradual migration process. Um, so that's kind of the, the approach that you want to take. And so you asked about a reverse proxy. Well, if you're going to be doing a web application migration and you're going to be doing it gradually over time, then you need to put something in front of your new and old applications to kind of tie them together to make them you know look and feel as if they're operating as a single application and the type of thing that you would use in a typical network diagram for that is something called a reverse proxy which anybody in the listening to the podcast or watching this video that's old enough to remember proxy servers might remember how you know you might have one computer on a network that has an internet connection and you can connect to that computer and it can kind of uh, connect you to the internet indirectly that is ca exactly what a reverse proxy does it just does it as incoming traffic in from the internet instead of out to the internet so you've got lots of clients connecting in they're going to hit this proxy first you could think of it as sort of being similar to a firewall in that way it's going to hit that first and then that's going to look at that traffic and decide does this go to this application or this application or this server or that server and it can make whatever intelligent decisions about routing that to the correct place. All that time, the client is none the wiser that they're getting routed behind the scenes to you know multiple different backend systems. Hmm. Uh, and you um, you have a preferred reverse proxy tool that you use, correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, when when you're talking about ASP.NET to ASP.NET Core migration specifically, uh, it would make a lot of sense to have a .NET based reverse proxy, right? You could loop in your IT department and basically, you know, get some hardware involved 
or some virtual hardware involved if you're in the cloud and have some sort of other machine that's playing the role of reverse proxy. But if you're a .NET developer, how cool would it be if instead of having three pieces, the reverse proxy, your legacy application, and your modern application, what if your modern application had the reverse proxy in it? So you only have Hmm. two pieces. So now you're deploying your modern application that has the reverse proxy layer in it and your legacy application, and that's it. Your modern application, then you would sort of expose to the, you know, out to the internet, and uh, that would be the one that's kind of deciding, does this traffic get handled by my me, the modern app, or does it get handled by the legacy app, and do I need to forward it on? Oh, interesting. Uh, tell me a little yeah. about the development experience. Are you, you said you're you're incorporating this this tool into your application uh, is that is that a NuGet package is it a library what is it that's a, that's exactly right it's a it's a library that's available as a NuGet package so okay. um, you know it's good uh, good modern .NET library here so of course it's available as a NuGet package and uh, not only is it available as a NuGet package to install yourself but there's this really great extension that you can get for Visual Studio that's called the uh, Upgrade Assistant. And the it's called the .NET Upgrade Assistant. That's the full name of it. It will help you through all kinds of different upgrade paths. So whether you're trying to upgrade your WinForms app to .NET, or if you're trying to upgrade your class library to a you know to a .NET standard class library, like I was just talking about, or your Azure Functions project from an old version of Azure Functions to a new version, or your ASP.NET to ASP.NET Core tons of different paths like that it can help you with if you install that in your visual studio uh, and that's a you know extension from microsoft uh, it will help you with your asp.net based on dotnet framework to asp.net core based on dotnet core upgrade by essentially installing a new project that is a you know modern dotnet project with yarp already installed in it for you and configured and everything so that's kind of a nice way to get started really really quickly and easily. Okay. And YARP, I, I'm looking at the documentation page right now. It stands for yet another reverse proxy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, reverse proxies have been pretty popular, I would say, for the last, I don't know, six years or something like that. Um, and so somebody has a sense of humor on that <laughs> team. Um, I'm reminded of uh, our friend Jesse Liberty used to have a podcast called Yapcast, yeah. which stood for yet another podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sort of a self-deprecating title to, to a really yes. good podcast. Yeah, uh, that's right. That, tell me about so if I uh, uh, add this library to a project, do uh, how do I work with it? Do I write code, or is it all through configuration? That's a great question. So you can do it both ways. Uh, there's a very simple programming model, which if you're using the .NET Upgrade Assistant, it'll basically set up this um, like very simple configuration model. Um, and it's got this kind of intelligence built into it. So, you know, I mentioned instead of the three pieces where you have that reverse proxy as a like completely separate uh, physical or virtual resource in your network, uh, you have the reverse proxy actually installed as a library into your modern application. That gives you some real powerful functionality. One of the things that that gives you is that, you know, you can configure that however you want in different environments, right? So you could have, Uh, different environments that automatically deploy with your modern code uh, with different configurations if you want to have you know three servers for some environments or use yarp to do load balancing like all of those things are possible just using configuration if you want to do something kind of unusual or fancy or weird let's say then it also has you know a full api that you can do whatever you want uh, with Yarp, basically. So you can kind of configure it at startup either through kind of standard configuration, you know, f- in, in an ASP.NET Core project just from like your application settings.json file, or you can kind of use these APIs to do something weird or fancy with it. Got it. So I, I've seen there are reverse proxies out there that'll do automatic encryption and decryption or uh, detect if a denial of service attack is coming and maybe throttle requests some will cache right. static content for better yep. performance that, that if i'm hearing you correctly those aren't built into this 
but the API allows you to extend it and add those features. Is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. I would also add to that that uh, pretty much any of the functionality of HTTP, the various versions of HTTP that are currently supported by ASP.NET Core, uh, you know, which is up to like version three, I think right now, um, you all of those are supported. So if you're doing uh, web sockets or you know something a little bit more fancy like that over HTTP, that's all supported by Yarp as well, which is nice. But yeah. Uh, yeah, if you're trying to basically get something out of the box that's going to do kind of what Cloudflare does or what you know a firewall would do for you or whatever, you could certainly write those things in Yarp. Hmm. Uh, but it would probably be better to get something off the shelf that's meant for for that that's like pre-configured with all those things. Yeah. Um, this is a, I noticed this is an open source project. It's on Microsoft's GitHub repository, mm-hmm. and there are 116 contributors. Is this something that people, the public, general public, is um, supporting? That's contributing back to the source code. Do you know, or is it just all maintained internally by Microsoft? Yeah, that's a good question. I, have, I haven't watched it super carefully to see like what the breakdown is. Uh, I can tell you, like a lot of .NET projects, it's you know largely the Microsoft team that's working on it, but that it is happening all in the open. And I think if you look carefully at the pull requests and stuff, you'll see that quite a bit of it, uh, a significant chunk of it is being offered by the community. So bug fixes and documentation and and that sort of thing. But uh, Microsoft is kind of in the driver's seat. Sure. Yeah, I'm I'm poking through it right now. It's hard to tell who's an mm-hmm. internal and who's an external person just it by looking a little at bit. it, especially with 116 different people. Sometimes yeah. uh, those 116, some of them are just creating uh, uh, feature requests or adding to the documentation, which is, I shouldn't exactly. say just, that's important stuff, but yep. they're not maintaining the core application itself. That's right. I think it's safe to say that there aren't 116 Microsoft employees that are working on it. Uh, that that's would be an awful re- lot. reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> Although there's like there's like two hundred and some thousand of us, so who knows? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Somebody's they they got to be doing something, right? But yeah, I th- I think this project is like a lot of the .NET code is is a mixture, but you know probably a majority by employees. Uh, we talked about two things today. I think uh, I want to ask you just uh, where to go. We talked about just the general process of migrating legacy applications, specifically from ASP.NET. I call it classic <laughs> to ASP.NET mm-hmm. Core, and also mm-hmm. from uh, and also specifically this reverse proxy YARP tool. Um, mm-hmm. What uh, when you when you're learning about this, or somebody who's watching this wants to learn more about this, can you recommend some resources? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you are already on the YARP documentation, I think. Right? I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Okay. Yep. So th- that's a good place to get started learning about YARP. And then um, another resource that we talked about that's another kind of good starting point is learning more about this .NET Upgrade Assistant, which has its Mm -hmm. own uh, documentation on the learn.microsoft.com site. And uh, we'll kind of walk you through how to use the Upgrade Assistant, specifically when you're doing doing a web-based migration, you know, from ASP.NET to ASP.NET Core. And then also the Yarp team has produced some content that's available on Microsoft's YouTube channel. So mm. if you go to YouTube and search for, you know, Microsoft and Yarp, uh, you'll you'll find there was uh, about a month ago now, so we're talking about maybe like May or June of 2023, there was a whole series that the team produced that was all kinds of, of different like detailed dig-ins to different pieces of those uh, functionality, including one piece of the lo- of the puzzle that we haven't really talked about, which is which is called the system dot web extensions. So, you know, anyone familiar with ASP.NET and ASP.NET Core for very long probably knows that one of the significant differences between those two is that uh, ASP.NET is based heavily on the system dot web namespace, and there's actually a system dot web dot DLL in the uh, framework in the .NET framework that that basically runs all of the stuff under the covers for ASP.NET. Right. But that all went away when uh, ASP.NET Core was rewritten. And the reason was because AS, uh, system.web was heavily tied into IIS and mm-hmm. Microsoft was trying to make this cross-platform. And so it couldn't be you know, tied into to ASP.NET. Uh, AS, sorry, ASP.NET Core couldn't be tied into IIS and still be cross-platform, obviously. Mm-hmm. So because of that, there is no really system.web anymore. Uh, 
Uh, but that means that if you have a lot of code that says system.web.this, you know, system.web.that, so you think of things like the request, the response, session, session state, uh, authentication, um, all of those types of, uh, of functionality. Uh, HTTP context is another one that a lot of people kind of use as their entry point into that system web stuff. All of that code is going to basically be broken. So if you have a class library that's doing a bunch of you know utility things for you like that, uh, that's going to be broken in, in ASP.NET Core. So Microsoft created this uh, extension, or I'm sorry, this, uh, this library that's available that's called the system.web extensions. And it's available on NuGet as well. And basically what that does is it's a .NET standard library. And if you run it on ASP.NET, it will use .NET frameworks, system.web namespaces for everything. But if you run it on .NET Core or later, it will use all the modern versions to oh, the, wow. for those exact same API. So it's basically forwarding those requests to the correct place in the underlying framework. Not 100% of the APIs, but all the most commonly used APIs it also has some utility functionality in it, like synchronizing between uh, .NET Framework and .NET Core uh, with things like session state and authentication. So if you have two different apps that you want to share the legacy app's authentication token, you can do that uh, using this library as well. Very slick. Yeah. All right. Um, this has been really educational for me. I, I was unfamiliar with... Uh, a most of the tools you brought up today until I, you, you taught me about them. So I really appreciate it. And I appreciate your time, Jay. Yeah. It was nice to chat with you, David. Thank you. I'm thankful today for the fact that technology was able to bring me and my friend, David, together to have this conversation. <laughs>